Falling in love with your best friend's older brother at 15 is easy. In fact, it's hard not to fall for him. While all the boys at school try their best to impress, he doesn't need to. Alan is grown up, confident, says what he thinks, and doesn't care about being liked. To him, his sister's friends are just little, silly girls, not potential girlfriends. When he was five, his mom would bring baby Rose in a stroller to the yard, and Alan had to sit next to her while she slept. When Alan was ten, he pushed Rose and her friends on the swings until their moms came to pick them up. Meanwhile, his friends were off doing guy stuff, fixing mopeds in old garages, going to the lake, or boxing. As a kid, Alan found Rose and her friends an annoying but unavoidable part of life. As he got older, he became more tolerant, friendly even, teasing them here and there, but they never caught his attention romantically. But for Summer, Alan was never just her friend's brother. From the age of 15, she was convinced that Alan was her destiny, her one true love, and there would be no one else in her life. Sure, he was older and smarter, but he had no idea where his real happiness lay. She watched the girls he dated, sometimes even followed him. What else could she do? She had to figure out how to become the type of girl he'd fall for. She had five years left, plenty of time to transform herself into someone Alan couldn't resist. The only thing that worried her was the chance he might get married. Then she'd just have to wait for the divorce. Time passed, but Alan still didn't seem to realize that summer was his destiny. She suffered in silence while he kept changing girlfriends, and she would run to Rose to cry about her fate. Rose would say, Summer, forget about him. My brother isn't the hero of your love story. Look at our life, dad ran off, and mom works just to keep food on the table. Alan isn't exactly a genius, he's decided that his good looks will help him get ahead. He's set on becoming a gold digger. He's looking for a rich, gullible girl who will fall for his irresistible face. You don't fit that mold. You're not rich, and you're definitely not stupid. Although, when you talk about Alan, I start to wonder about your intelligence. I love him. Someday he'll want a family and loyalty, and I'll be right there. Maybe in 30 years, when he's lost his looks and is all worn out. Do you really want a secondhand prince? You're not planning to wait for him forever, are you? Summer, believe me, he's not someone you can build a life around. Even though he's my brother, I can't say a single good thing about him. He's calculating, sly, and has no interest in family or loyalty. If I ever get in his way, he'll step right over me without a second thought. I don't believe you. He just doesn't know how much I love him. And he doesn't need to know. If he finds out, he'll just use you. You've been hanging around him for five years. You think he doesn't notice? He notices. But he doesn't need you right now. The moment he does, he'll put on the greatest love act you've ever seen, if you're lucky, you'll survive it. Forget him. Find someone more worthy of you. By the way, remember my birthday is tomorrow? Twenty years old, no joke. We're meeting at the club at seven. Will Alan be there? Idiot. Of course, he'll be there. Where else would he go? When you love someone, it doesn't matter what people think or say about them. Summer had loved Alan for years. She had built him up in her mind as this mature, intelligent, strong man and truly believed that's who he was. What nonsense! A calculating gold digger. No way, he was the best. He just hadn't met his soulmate yet. Rose, even though she was his sister, couldn't see the real him. She was just too used to him, holding on to old childhood grudges. That's why she talked badly about him. Tomorrow would be the day everything changed. It was time for Alan to find out that Summer loved him. He would probably be surprised, and he wouldn't respond right away, but he'd realize that Summer wasn't just his little sister's friend anymore. Tomorrow, at the club, Summer would finally tell Alan how she felt. She couldn't keep it inside any longer. Rose thought it was a bad idea, 
but everyone always knows what's right, and yet no one ever does it. And Summer? She didn't know the right thing, so she would do what she had decided to do. Summer stood in front of the mirror, critically examining herself. Her look had to be stunning. Bold makeup and a flashy dress wouldn't work for a regular at the nightclub. A stylish but boring high society woman wasn't the right choice either. She needed to ooze charm, looking tasteful but not expensive. Not that she had the option, there were no designer brands in her wardrobe anyway. The club was booming with music. Colorful lights flashed across the dance floor and swept through the room. Barely dressed dancers twisted and turned inside transparent cubes, hyping up the crowd. Not that this crowd needed any extra excitement, people were dancing wildly, giving it their all. The waiters were struggling to keep up, and the bartender could barely keep the glasses full. The more eager partygoers showed off in front of the dancers' cubes but couldn't get close, so they returned to the dance floor to release their energy there. The crowd surged, yelled, and jumped in a wild frenzy of joy and celebration. Summer immediately spotted Rose's group. They were sitting on sofas in the back of the room, gathered around a table covered with food and drinks. A trendy track started playing, and the group headed to the dance floor, leaving Alan behind. Perfect timing. This was her chance to say everything she'd been holding in. Summer walked over to the table, her legs shaking, her voice trembling, but she still managed to say. Alan, I love you. Don't answer right away, just think about it. No one will ever love you like I do. I'm ready to do anything for you. There, she said it. Now she just had to survive the embarrassment. Alan looked at her with condescension, not even surprised. He was used to these kinds of confessions from silly young girls. Sure, Summer was pretty, if he wanted a quick fling, she'd be perfect. But she was madly in love, and that would be trouble. He needed to let her down easy. She was one of those girls who dreamed of love like in the movies or books, all high drama. That wasn't what Alan wanted. What movies? What love? He needed a simple girl with money, not this poor girl who was as broke as he was. And two broke people don't make a happy couple. Alan's love life hadn't been going well. He hadn't managed to snag a rich fiancé. His handsome face caught attention, but the girls from wealthy families had smart parents who quickly and bluntly explained what Alan was all about. They gave their daughters an ultimatum, either this pretty-faced loser or a stable life with a husband we approve of. Most girls chose money and security. Some girls chose Alan, but when they said they were ready to run away with him to the ends of the earth without money, Alan was the one who ran. It wasn't working out for him yet, but he hadn't given up hope. Summer didn't fit into his plans. He was busy working on his next target in the club, and Summer's confession was an unwelcome interruption. Look, girl, I never said anything to you, and I definitely didn't make any promises. What love? Half of Rose's friends are like this. The music quieted, and Summer's desperate shout echoed through the club. Alan, I love you. I can't live without you. Everyone went silent. No one laughed or even smirked. There must have been something more than just desperation in Summer's voice, something raw and genuine. The DJ quickly played the next track. This club had seen it all, and heartbroken girls weren't enough to ruin the party. A tall, beautiful woman approached the table. Alan, what's going on here? Nothing, babe. She's just one of my sister's friends who thinks she's in love with me. You know how it is, they're always confessing their love to me. It's just part of being the older brother. She's leaving now. And so she left. Her legs barely carried her, her head was spinning. If only she could get away from here, then she could collapse somewhere. The bartender caught her, sat her on a stool, and poured her some water. She sat there, thinking about nothing. It was strange, having no thoughts in her head, just complete emptiness. The bartender poured her something else, and she drank it. She stared blankly at one spot, he poured again, and she drank again. 
She couldn't taste what she was drinking, couldn't see what was happening around her, and cried non-stop. She got up and headed for the exit. Outside, it was raining, fitting weather for her misery. How was she supposed to go on? Everything she dreamed of had turned to dust. Alan didn't love her, and without him, life didn't make sense. Her head spun either from the tears or the alcohol. She walked aimlessly, not seeing where she was going. She stepped forward, and suddenly, someone grabbed her roughly and yanked her back. She fell into a puddle, and a voice yelled in her ear. Are you crazy? Where are you going? Trying to end it all. Why jump in front of a car? You're going to ruin the driver's life. If he files a report on you, I'll sign it. I saw you throw yourself under his wheels. You've got a broken heart, and he's supposed to pay for it. A stranger pulled Summer out of the puddle and helped her stand. Muddy drops dripped from her dress. A terrified man stood nearby, probably the driver of the car that almost hit her. She couldn't remember where she had been heading, how she ended up on the road, or even seeing the car. I'm so sorry, really. I wasn't trying to jump in front of your car. I don't remember anything. It's all right, it ended well. Just be more careful. If this guy hadn't grabbed your arm, I definitely would have hit you. Well, I guess I'll be on my way. She could have died just now. For who? For Alan. Sure, she had fallen in love, but she wasn't ready to die for him. I'll survive this. If it hadn't been for this close call, I would have been heartbroken, thinking I couldn't live without him. But almost dying made her realize that the most important thing was just to live, whether with or without Alan. Summer took a deep breath. The air felt so fresh. Her savior stood nearby, watching her with a look that was either confused or mocking. Who was this guy anyway? Of course, she should thank him, but part of her wanted to tell him to get lost. He was way too loud and cocky. Thanks. I guess I'll be going now. Goodbye. Where are you going looking like that? They won't even let you on a bus, you get everything dirty. And what's it to you? I saw you drinking at the bar. Followed you, and good thing I did. Where do you need to go? I can't go home like this. I'll call my friend. Let me guess, all your friends are still dancing in the club, and you don't want to go back there. Come to my place. You can wash your dress, stay the night, and figure things out in the morning. Don't worry, I won't try anything. I have two rooms, you can lock yourself in. Right now, you're not just dirty, you're also drunk. No way you can go to your parents like this. Something tells me they aren't exactly progressive, and seeing you like this won't make them happy, but it'll definitely leave an impression. Summer's head was still buzzing. She knew she couldn't go home, but going to a complete stranger's place. What now? Sleep on the streets. Well, there's a first time for everything. All right, let's go. In the taxi, Summer was completely out of it. She tried to sit up straight but kept sliding to the side. Eventually, she fell asleep with her head on her rescuer's shoulder. He ended up carrying her out of the car. Somehow, she made it to the apartment and collapsed on the couch, only waking up the next morning. She opened her eyes and had no idea where she was. A comfortable bed, clean sheets, a fresh scent, and a totally unfamiliar room. She started to remember. Oh God, she was at that cocky guy's place. What was his name again? Damn, she didn't even ask. The guy who saved her last night walked into the room. Awake? What do you want for breakfast? I don't have oysters and champagne, but I can make scrambled eggs or an omelette. Also, I think it's time we properly introduce ourselves, it's kind of awkward not knowing your name. I'm Daryl. And I'm Summer. Well, get up, Summer. Coffee's ready. Summer glanced around the apartment. Very cool. This Daryl wasn't some average guy. The apartment was small but stylish. This kind of design doesn't come cheap. 
Did he earn it himself, or was he from a rich family? But why should she care? He let her stay the night, she should just say thanks and leave. She sipped her coffee, sneaking glances at Daryl. Last night, she didn't really notice what he looked like. He was attractive, tall, probably in his thirties. She wondered who he was but felt too awkward to ask. Daryl didn't seem interested in her either, not hinting at anything, so there was no need to impose. Just finish the coffee, thank him, and go. But wait, what was she supposed to wear? Summer was sitting there in a bathrobe Daryl had left on the bed. Where was her dress? Oh God, she had fallen in a puddle last night. Daryl, where's my dress? I washed it. It's dry now, just needs ironing. I didn't want to mess it up, so you can do it. By the way, care to explain what kind of tragedy led to yesterday's drama? I get the gist, unrequited love, but what made you jump in front of a car? I didn't jump. I don't know how to drink, and the bartender kept pouring me drinks, so I ended up walking into the street. Yeah, there was a reason. I was in love with Alan for five years. I dreamed I'd confess my love, he'd understand everything, hug me, and we'd live happily ever after. I know, I'm an idiot. But haven't you ever fallen in love like that? I've been in love even more intensely. Imagine, I loved her like crazy, couldn't live without her, and she left me for my boss. And he's the type to go after anything that moves. Doesn't matter if they're pretty or not, as long as they're a woman. Now she's marrying him, and I still have to work there. All my colleagues smirk at me. Wow, I thought there was nothing worse than embarrassing yourself in front of a whole club, but you win. Something tells me things won't work out between your ex and your boss. Maybe you should try to win her back. I don't want to. It's weird. It's like someone snapped their fingers, and it's gone. No love, not even jealousy. I should be heartbroken, but I'm not. I don't get what she sees in him. I'm young, charming, talented, and he's just an old, talentless, sweaty bag of money. I guess if you're desperate enough, you can make yourself sleep with a disgusting man for money, but why? I don't get you women. Right, because we don't have brains. Are you one of those guys who thinks women are a lower form of evolution? Or maybe you're just jealous of your boss. He can buy himself another Barbie, and you can't. Not at all. I actually feel sorry for women. Your lives are so hard, constant stress. Broken nails, or worse, your friend's chest is bigger than yours. And you say you're not suffering or upset. Nope, you're definitely still not over it, but don't take it out on me. I'm a completely uncalculating, selfless fool. Now hand me the iron, I'll check on my dress and head out. Summer walked down the street, thinking that Daryl was right. Sometimes it happens like that. Yesterday, it was a crazy love, and today, she couldn't believe she had wasted five years of her life on it. Since childhood, she had fantasized about a lifelong love, didn't look at anyone else, didn't get to know anyone. Alan was the only one in her dreams. She lived like it was some kind of TV drama, placing her entire being on the altar of love, indulging in her own sacrifice. Just a little more patience, and happiness would come. But it turned out Alan didn't care about her love. He didn't want her devotion, her passion, or even Summer herself. Summer sadly realized that she had trapped herself in this made-up love and doomed herself to loneliness. She didn't have a boyfriend because she had constantly rejected everyone. She didn't have a circle of friends or acquaintances either, because she didn't need anyone. Summer denied herself the possibility of making new connections. She hadn't been living at all. She thought life would start once Alan was with her. Now, it turned out, it was all for nothing. She barely had any close friends either, only Rose, and that was because she was relative to Alan. And now there was no one else to talk to about her love. Well, maybe Tracy, the cheerful redhead who Summer knew from college. Tracy had worked in the library, where the pay was low, but there was plenty of time to study. 
While Summer was stuck in her misery, waiting for something that never happened, Tracy was living the fun college life. She was a regular at nightclubs, wrote poetry, acted in student theater, and by the time she was 20, she was already married. Rose couldn't understand what Tracy, with her endless energy, saw in that plain, skinny, completely unremarkable guy. But Tracy loved her Russ. She thought he was a brilliant lawyer, and Russ adored his lively, unstoppable wife. Summer decided she had said goodbye to the, I can't live without Alan, phase of her life. It had been quite the dramatic farewell, she never expected that from herself. But now what? She needed to meet with Tracy and Rose, tell them everything, and see what advice they had. They had more experience with these things. As Summer walked, she noticed a small door with a sign that read, Lorena the Fortune Teller. Readings and Predictions Summer never believed in fortune telling. She thought all fortune tellers and numerologists were frauds. She had recently seen a well-known astrologer on TV who urged women to visit her before getting married. The astrologer claimed she would calculate everything, consult the stars, and with 100% accuracy, tell them whether the couple was truly compatible and if they should even marry at all. This same astrologer had been married four times herself, so somewhere along the way, the stars must have made a mistake, or maybe they only told the truth for large sums of money. But right now, Summer felt an urge to go in and see if Lorena could guess anything about her life. Let this be the start of a change, though really, the change had started yesterday when she got drunk and spent the night at a stranger's house. She opened the door, walked down the stairs, and found another door. A middle-aged woman greeted Summer, looking completely ordinary, with nothing mysterious about her. Here to see Lorena. Come on in. Summer entered a small, dark room. Well, this was exactly what she expected. A round table with a black cloth, candles, a crystal ball, a bowl with pink smoke swirling above it, and a deck of tarot cards. Amulets and herbs hung from the ceiling. At least there were no chicken feet or rat tails. The fortune teller, Lorena, a striking woman with bold makeup and an overwhelming number of bracelets and rings, fixed her magnetic gaze on Summer. Clinking her bracelets, she gestured to a chair and handed Summer the deck of cards. Shadows, five cards, she commanded. Lorena took the cards Summer pulled and spread them out in front of her. Wow! You've got major changes happening in your life right now. Forget everything that was before, it wouldn't have worked out anyway. A challenging period is ahead. I see a man beside you, someone with status and money. You'll get married, but the happiness won't last long. Lots of envious eyes on you. I also see a woman standing like a shadow behind you, she's dangerous. That's all. What do you mean, that's all? Who's the woman? Summer asked. The fortune teller waved her ring-adorned hands over the crystal ball, closed her eyes as if listening to some hidden voices, and dropped something into the bowl, turning the pink smoke green. No, the universe won't tell me anything else today. Well, the universe wasn't feeling very chatty today. Still, this was more or less what Summer had expected, though Lorena had guessed right about today's changes. The part about the wealthy husband was clearly just for show. Where was a broke student and librarian like her going to find a rich man? Even though Summer didn't believe the prediction, she knew she'd still think about it. Now she'd start dreaming of a wealthy husband. Fine, she could dream for a bit. She'd deal with disappointment later. The first thing she had to do was tell her friends about Alan, Daryl, and the fortune teller. So much had happened, she felt like she was going to burst if she didn't share it immediately. She'd have to wait until the evening, though. They were meeting at a cafe near the college. You did great, Summer. I thought you'd never let go of my brother, Rose said. You're an idiot, Summer, Tracy announced bluntly. You finally met a decent guy, even spent the night at his place, and what did you get out of it? You don't know who he is, didn't even get his phone number. But going to the fortune teller, that was smart. Maybe she was talking about Daryl. Tracy. 
Rose interrupted. That's nonsense. Who believes in fortune tellers these days? I disagree. You should try everything for self-development. For self-development, you should go to the library, not waste money on scammers. Now she's got Summer's head all twisted. Summer needs to meet normal guys, but now she's going to obsess over some future happiness with a rich and powerful man. When is she going to live? And what if this prince never shows up? What then? You're right about that, Tracy admitted. Summer, how about I introduce you to Russ's friend? He's a lawyer. You'd like him. No, Tracy, don't. I can handle it myself. You've already let one slip by. By the way, do you even know where Daryl lives? Maybe you should drop by. Have you all lost your minds? How can I just show up at some stranger's house? He only took me in out of pity and had no problem kicking me out in the morning. Besides, I'm embarrassed. A drunk woman passed out in a puddle isn't exactly the image of romance. Every time I think about how he dragged my dirty, drunk self out of the taxi, put me to bed, and even washed my dress, I want to crawl into a hole. I can't even look him in the eye, let alone visit him. Wow, our quiet one really went wild yesterday, Tracy teased. Her friends were right. Summer was lost, unsure of what to do next. Sitting around, waiting for promised happiness to just arrive, was foolish. But she couldn't shake the habit of waiting. The days passed, and a growing sense of sadness and hopelessness settled in. Daytime wasn't too bad, work and responsibilities kept her busy. But at night, it all hit her hard. Despair and anxiety would wash over her, making it hard to breathe, like a heavy stone was pressing on her chest, or a dusty sack weighing her down. Her thoughts were just as heavy and suffocating. Nothing will work out for you, Summer. You'll never break out of your shell. There won't be love, family, or happiness. Summer had strange, sticky dreams that felt impossible to escape. She dreamed she was performing in a play. She needed to go on stage, but she couldn't. She wasn't an actress, she didn't know how, and she didn't know the lines. They pushed her forward, but her legs wouldn't move. They practically carried her onto the stage. She stood there, barefoot and in rags, trying to say something, then scream, but nothing came out. The audience was dead silent, watching her intently. What were they expecting from her? She had to say something. Summer tried to scream and woke up to the sound of her own voice, struggling to shake off the sticky dream. Every time she woke up with a pounding heart in cold sweat, Summer thought to herself, it's true. I can't say or do anything. All I can do is wait and drift along. Rose and Tracy tried to pull her out of it, to get her out of the house, but it was useless. Summer kept withdrawing into herself. She needed a push, something big to shake her up. Something had to happen, something important enough to change Summer's life drastically. Summer, I can feel it, something's about to happen. I have this feeling that something big is coming, Rose said. Rose, weren't you the one who told me fortune-telling was nonsense and superstition? Why do you suddenly believe in it now? This isn't fortune-telling, I just know it. Rose's desire to help her friend and her confidence in the upcoming changes must have nudged the universe into action. Too bad Rose couldn't predict how those changes would turn out. Maybe she wouldn't have asked the universe to help Summer after all. The universe's intervention was sudden, harsh, and unpleasant. Summer even thought that maybe she was just destined to end up in puddles from time to time. The weather was awful, rain and snow fighting each other, gloomy and bleak, without a hint of hope. The streets were covered in a prickly gray slush of mud and snow. Summer slipped and fell right into that mess. Her bag ended up in a puddle, her hands were dirty, and her knee hurt. She carefully stood up and slowly, trying not to fall again, stepped toward a bench. She needed to sit down and assess the damage. Her coat was dirty, her bag was soaked, her tights were ripped, and her knee was scraped. Minor damage, really, 
but it was still frustrating enough to bring tears to her eyes. It felt like she couldn't catch a break. Everything seemed fine, but there was no joy in her life. Plenty of reasons to cry, but none to smile. If there had been any reasons for happiness, a scraped knee wouldn't have brought her to tears. Now how was she going to get home? She couldn't get on a bus with torn tights, and she had no money for a taxi. Two small problems, yet Summer sat there, sobbing, unable to stop. The tears just flowed on their own. Miss, do you need help? I saw you fall. Are you hurt? Did you break anything? A voice interrupted her. No, I didn't break anything. Thanks, but I don't need any help. I can handle it on my own. I can see how you're handling it, sitting here crying. Let me give you a ride. You're all soaked. Why won't you leave me alone? I don't need anyone. I'll manage without help. Who hurt you so badly? The man asked, lifting Summer to her feet. Stop sitting in the rain. It's all right, we'll figure it out. What problems could you possibly have? Of course, only well-dressed, confident men have real problems. And what about her? Just trivial nonsense. Summer got angry, trying to pull away, but the man held on to her arms, dragged her to his car, and put her in the front seat. He rummaged through the glove box and handed her some cotton. Here, clean up your knee. Look, there's a mall right there. We'll get you new tights, grab some coffee, and you can tell me what happened. By the way, I'm Austin. The coffee was hot and fragrant, the cafe was warm and cozy. Her tears had dried, and the frustration had faded. Really, why had she made such a big deal out of nothing? Summer watched her new acquaintance. Young, about thirty or maybe a bit older, well-groomed, stylishly dressed, and clearly confident in himself. At first, Summer said it was love at first sight. Though it was hard to say exactly when it started, or if it was even love. No, it wasn't love. It was amazement, astonishment that a man like him had noticed her. Austin wooed her beautifully, spoke of love, and turned her life into a fairy tale. And she gave in. She wanted happiness, wanted love, and Austin seemed perfect, flawless. They lived together, and Summer found it odd that Austin wasn't introducing her to his friends or family. Maybe it just wasn't the right time. Perhaps his family had different customs, but it still felt strange. Summer, however, was fully enjoying their life together. It didn't matter that they weren't married, they were a family. The house was like something out of a movie, and now she was the one taking care of it, waiting for her man to come home from work, cooking meals. The fortune teller had been right about a wealthy, high-status man coming into her life. But even Lorena, the fortune teller, couldn't have known that Austin would also be the most caring, gentle, and handsome man. Rose once tried to warn Summer not to lose herself in the relationship. After all, he hadn't proposed. Oh, Rose, stop saying nonsense. He's wonderful, and will get married eventually. Summer, you always swing from one extreme to another. You spent years barely leaving the house, never meeting anyone, and now you're already talking marriage. Has he even introduced you to his parents? What if he's married? He's over 30, attractive, wealthy, and a great catch in every way. Why isn't he married? Was he just waiting for you? Oh, Summer, don't get yourself into trouble again. But Summer wasn't listening to anyone, not her friends, not her mother. She was lost in her happiness. Once again, her world revolved around a single person, Austin. Sometimes she had fleeting doubts that this wasn't right, that it was the same pattern as with Alan, but she couldn't help herself. She often thought about her recent hardships and believed that Austin was her reward for all the pain. Still, Rose's words planted seeds of doubt. How had Austin lived before her? He never really talked about it, and honestly, she hadn't asked. It didn't matter, what mattered was that he was with her now. But after that conversation with Rose, Summer finally decided to ask. Of course I was married. 
I have a son, he's four now. I married for love. At the time, I was an up-and-coming financial analyst, just starting out at an international company. She was an aspiring actress, beautiful and ambitious. While I, as a serious professional, didn't attend many social events, she was always in the spotlight, showing her face wherever she could. She went a little crazy with it, constantly chasing PR opportunities, and even the birth of our son didn't slow her down. Then, as it often happens, she met a wealthy sponsor who recognized her underrated talent. A star like her deserved fame, money, and adoration. What followed was a messy, public divorce, with all the drama you'd expect from show business, fighting over money, property, and the child. It was a PR gift for her. For me, it nearly cost my career. Big firms don't like unstable employees. My father had a heart attack, it ruined his reputation. And my mother, well, she's never wanted to hear the word marriage again. I tried telling her about us, but she nearly had a breakdown. She's terrified of another scandal and begs me to wait. In truth, Austin had spared Summer from hearing everything his mother had said when he brought up the idea of marrying again. Amalia still couldn't forgive herself for agreeing to her son's first marriage. In their family, she was the queen, and her word was law. If she had said no back then, there would have been no wedding. But she thought that a marriage between a young, promising financial analyst and a rising star was a smart move. After all, popularity had never hurt anyone. Now she blamed herself for her husband's heart attack and for putting her son's career on hold. It never crossed her mind that her no might not have stopped Austin, and that he would have married the girl he loved anyway. That just wasn't how things worked in their family. His upbringing wouldn't allow it. Besides, Austin owed his career, and therefore his financial success, to his parents. Whether out of respect for them or fear of losing his prestigious, well-paying job, Austin would have stopped himself. Amelia's excessive belief in her maternal authority let her down. No one had ever gone against her will before. She hadn't calculated all the risks and never expected that the poor little starlet would quickly ditch her young, promising husband for a sponsor with not just a stained reputation, but a rotten one. And a strong family would be replaced by instant fame from a disgraceful scandal. Amalia wasn't an idealist, she understood everything. Her son would get married eventually, though the family would be much more at peace if he stayed single. After all, he already had a child. Why did he need a wife? Another troublemaker would only cause more problems. Then again, an unmarried man pushing 40 didn't inspire much trust either. In fact, it could hurt his career. But when Austin announced that he was going to marry some librarian, Amalia couldn't hold back. Where did you find her? Do you visit the library often now? Amazing. No one's saying that reading books is bad. What's bad is picking up a mousy librarian and dragging her into our home. How long have you two known each other? About six months. Such a solid amount of time. Perfect for marriage. Quick little girl, huh? She snagged you fast. Is she that good in bed? Or, after getting burned by that actress, you've decided to pick a poor girl who'll wash your feet? Your first wife gave your father a heart attack. Are you hoping the second one will send him to the grave? Mom, what are you talking about? I'm talking about what I know. Your librarian will never set foot in this house. The fact that you sleep with her doesn't give her the right to be part of our family. Don't you dare bring her here. I will never have such a daughter-in-law. But mom, we live together. You can live with whoever you want, but that girl is not for you. Wasn't one failed star enough to ruin your image? Now you want to finish it off by introducing a plain, insignificant girl as your wife. Have you thought about how you'll present her in our circle? Austin, I don't want to hear another word about her. Live with her, sleep with her, but marriage is out of the question. Naturally, Austin didn't relay his mother's opinion to Summer. They lived happily and in love, but doubts had started to grow. If his mother didn't change her mind, 
she would make Austin's life miserable, and Summer's even more so. It was a shame because Summer was a good girl, and she could have been the perfect wife. Or maybe his mother was right, perhaps Summer wasn't the right match for him. Too simple, not from their world. When Summer told him she was pregnant, Austin was caught off guard. A baby was good, of course, but the timing was all wrong, too soon. He had just received an incredible job offer that could launch his career. There was no turning that down. And Summer with a baby would demand too much of his time. Austin had already begun to realize that he might have made a mistake, that Summer wasn't his destiny after all, but he couldn't leave a girl who was in love with him, especially not one who was pregnant. They got married in secret, with the condition that no one would know. Summer, of course, wanted to tell her friends, but she kept quiet. Austin was more important to her than all her friends. She locked herself at home, didn't go out, didn't talk to anyone, and thought that was normal. Rose and Tracy started to worry. It was strange that they were never invited to Austin's house. Summer used to call sometimes, though all she ever talked about was her husband and their happy family life, nothing else. Now, she had disappeared completely. Did he lock his wife in the basement or something? We need to go and find out. They tried calling Summer first, but she didn't answer. So, they decided to go over. What if she didn't want to see them? Well, then she could tell them why. They hadn't done anything to hurt her or argued, and now she seemed to have no other friends. Why push away her last friends without even an explanation? Rose, are we sure this is Summer's place? Well, no, it's not her house, but I think this is where she lives now. You know, with a house like this, I'm not surprised she's forgotten about us. Maybe we shouldn't have come. We don't really fit in here. What are you talking about? What do you mean we don't fit? If Summer fits in, then so do we. If she tells us in some posh voice that no one's waiting for us, I'll lose faith in humanity. Oh God, this is nerve-wracking. Just call her before I lose my faith in people entirely. Summer ran out to hug her friends. God, how she missed them. How had she been living without them for so long? Why couldn't she balance love and friendship? Why did men always come first? No matter how wonderful he was, he wasn't the only important person in her life. Summer realized this now, and her heart ached. My dear girls, how did I live without you? Tracy and Rose wandered through the house like they were in a museum, baffled at how an ordinary person could afford such a place. It had to be either some huge financial scam or someone was taken out of the picture. And Summer, living in this unbelievable luxury, claimed that Austin was clean. Maybe, but it was hard for them, poor and from the provinces, to believe it. Something wasn't right. Summer, with her rounded belly, looked stunning. The girls gently touched her belly, debating names. It was already known she was having a girl. They dreamed of taking walks with the baby. If you ever need anything, we'll come over any time, day or night. You're the first one of us to have a baby. It turned out the baby wasn't just any baby but the child of her legal husband. So, you're a married woman now? Yes. Why didn't you tell us? We were worried when you disappeared. We thought maybe he had locked you in the basement and was starving you. Summer, you did well. You've got a house, a handsome, rich husband, and a baby on the way. Tracy, that's how you get married. I mean, Austin's a good guy, but not perfect. Rose, keep your envy to yourself. You're the expert on who to marry, which is why you're still single. Summer, what's with all the secrecy? Why a secret wedding? I get that maybe you didn't want a big celebration, but not even your parents know. That's odd. Well, his mom doesn't want him to get married right now. But girls, that doesn't matter. The important thing is that we're together. Summer, you're smart and sensible, but love always makes you lose your head. You spent five years chasing Alan, couldn't find a single flaw in that jerk, and now a secret marriage because Austin's mom doesn't want to hear about her son's wedding. 
Seriously, Summer, you need to go to your mother-in-law and tell her you don't care what she wants or doesn't want. You and Austin are married, and you're having a baby. Sure, she'll probably freak out, but she'll get over it. How do you plan to present the baby to her later? Did your perfect husband think about that? Friend, I think you've gotten yourself into another messy situation. But what am I saying? You're not listening to anyone right now. All you think about is your husband. He's your king and God. Amalia had decided that this provincial girl had overstayed her welcome in her son's life. She was surely making plans now. Since Austin couldn't make any decisions himself, she would have to act. She opened the door to his apartment with her own key and gave the place a thorough look. It seemed that Summer hadn't yet redecorated to her taste. At least she had enough sense for that. In the living room, a girl was sitting in an armchair reading a book. Not bad, at least she was reading a book and not glued to her phone. But just as Amalia had suspected, she was young, pretty, and naive, naive enough to believe that a man like Austin could seriously be interested in her. Hello, dear. I'm Amalia, Austin's mother. And you must be Summer. Summer was caught off guard. She hadn't expected to see her here. How should she behave? You're not even going to greet me. You're just going to sit there while a woman much older than you stands in front of you. I had a feeling you had some manners issues. Otherwise, you wouldn't have stayed in the house of a young man for so long. Summer struggled to get out of the deep armchair and stood up. Amalia was shocked to see her large belly. God, she was about to give birth soon. Well, son, why didn't you tell me sooner? We could have taken care of this. This girl wouldn't have turned down money. And now what? This is a burden for life. She'll blackmail him and drain him of money. I see you're a clever one. You've got it all figured out. Or do you think that now Austin will marry you? Amalia, you don't seem to know, we're already married. At first, Amalia thought she'd misheard, then she became outraged. Yeah, right. Keep lying. Summer walked over to the desk, grabbed the marriage certificate, and handed it to Amalia. Amalia quickly glanced at it, and damn, they really were married. But how did this happen? He nearly ruined his career with one girl and then picked up another right away. What to do now? She couldn't just kick this bold girl out of the house like she planned, at least not right now. Who knows, maybe she was just as unstable as Austin's first wife, and if a scandal broke out, it would be tough to save her son's career again. She needed to think carefully about how to protect her boy. Amalia shoved the marriage certificate back at Summer, shot her the most contemptuous look she could muster, and walked toward the exit without saying a word. So much for meeting the mother-in-law. What a powerful woman, it gave her chills. Amalia kicked off her mission to save her son from the pregnant predator by introducing herself to Summer's mother. She arrived at the right building and stepped inside. A shabby hallway and a worn-out door greeted her. It was clear that poverty reigned. A pretty, petite woman opened the door, and the delicious smell of pie wafted out. Amalia suddenly realized she hadn't had a homemade pie in ages. Hello, my name is Amalia. I'm Austin's mother, your daughter's husband. The kids didn't bother to introduce us, so I came myself. Oh, how nice to meet you. Please, come in. I'm Dolores. Amalia looked around, tiny kitchen, living room, and bedroom. That was it, just as she expected. It was clean but poor. It was clear Summer wouldn't be leaving Austin's home anytime soon, she had no desire to come back here. But Amalia always gets what she wants. Amalia and Dolores sat in the little kitchen, sipping tea and sharing pie while Amalia asked Dolores all about Summer's life. She wanted to know everything, where she studied, who her friends were, and who she dated. Oh, she didn't date anyone. You know, when she was about 15, she fell in love with her friend's older brother. She thought she'd grow up and marry Alan. But when she did grow up, 
she realized what a loser he was. Thank God she came to her senses, otherwise, she would have been miserable. He's not a good guy. There's a club nearby where he hangs out all the time, looking for a richer bride. That's the extent of her romantic interests. Then she met your son. While Amalia asked more questions, she thought that Alan, the greedy money-hungry guy, could be useful after all. Dolores could sing the praises of her wonderful daughter as much as she wanted, but Amalia knew the worth of girls like that. Finding Alan wasn't hard, everyone knew that handsome lover boy. For a small fee, he agreed to help. All he had to do was casually run into Summer outside the hospital and hang around the maternity ward at the right time. When Summer came out of the hospital, she bumped into Alan. Summer, great to see you, Alan said, hugging her and giving her a peck on the cheek. I see you're doing well. Married? Yeah, Alan, I should go. It's getting a bit chilly. Of course, Summer didn't see the young man who took several photos of her meeting with Alan. Amalia didn't say anything to Austin. First, she needed to gather more evidence to make sure her son had no doubts about his wife's fidelity. The blow had to be precise and effective. Besides, Amalia was furious with Austin. How dare he marry without her approval? It didn't even matter who he married, the very act of disobedience was outrageous. So, the marriage was doomed. Even if the girl came from a family of English lords, a son must never go against his mother. While Amalia plotted her schemes, Summer was preparing for childbirth. Time was running out, and Summer was extremely anxious. Austin was busy at work, preparing for a new position. He was exhilarated by the promised opportunities. He had no time to comfort his wife, nor the desire to. All he could say was, everything will be fine, and he said it more for himself than for Summer. Deep down, he felt that a new job and a career boost didn't mix well with the arrival of a baby and sleepless nights. Everything seemed so ill-timed. The big house felt empty and quiet. You could hear the ticking of a clock from a distant room. Austin had left early, and Summer wandered alone through the empty house again. She wished her beloved would always be by her side, supporting and encouraging her, but he was too busy. As she walked through the house, tears welled up in her eyes. Everything here felt foreign. Without Austin, she didn't want anything, and he was pulling away. Had he suddenly fallen out of love? No, that was just the hysteria of a pregnant woman. Summer had heard that it could happen. The gynecologist who monitored Summer was an older, plump woman who was strict with her patients. She believed that pity and coddling had no place in her profession, especially with young and inexperienced women. They were already scared, and any hint of sympathy would send them into tears and panic. There had to be a conviction that everything the doctor said was the truth and must be followed. All right, Summer, you're checking into the hospital tomorrow. But it's too early. Can I stay home for a bit? I feel fine. You need to think about the baby, not just yourself. Don't be scared, everything's fine. But it's better to go to the maternity ward early. I think our little beauty doesn't want to wait until the due date. This isn't up for discussion. You'll rest there for a week under supervision. Summer absolutely didn't want to go to the hospital. That meant another week without Austin. That evening, she waited for him to come home from work and imagined how much she would miss him. She wasn't thinking about the baby, she was thinking about Austin. How would he cope without her? Austin took the news calmly. Well, if that's how it had to be. He even thought it might be nice to get a little break from his pregnant wife. Fortunately, Summer didn't notice Austin's indifference amid her own worries. That night, Summer felt like another chapter of her life had come to an end. Soon she would return to this house, but not alone. She tried to picture how it would be, but instead of joyful excitement, she felt anxiety, as if she sensed something inevitable and unpleasant looming ahead. Tossing and turning in bed, she sighed deeply. She envisioned sunny, tender images of future happiness, but they transformed into dark, 
cracked pictures of sadness and disappointment framed in crooked frames. Summer realized she was dreaming, she didn't want to see it, but waking up was impossible. She couldn't find a way out of this terrifying art exhibit. In one of the paintings, she saw Austin. He was yelling fiercely about something. The sound rang in her head, jolting her out of her nightmare. It was the alarm clock. Time to get up. Well, the hospital was just the hospital, it wasn't the end of the world. It was a bit disappointing that Austin had left so early again, without even saying goodbye, just sending the driver. It stung a little, but her excitement overshadowed all other feelings. After all, she was going to have a baby. The stern gynecologist had been right. Their daughter had decided to make a sudden entrance. The baby was doing fine, and so was Summer, if you could consider the overwhelming longing for her husband normal. Austin came by, looked at the baby, and smiled. But he pretended to be thrilled. In reality, he didn't feel much. Well, a baby is a baby. But Summer saw it differently. This wasn't just any baby, it was her and Austin's baby, the most beautiful baby in the world. How could such a miracle have come to be? The nurses chuckled at the young mom, watching her look at her daughter as if she were something extraordinary. Her eyes shone with happiness. Everyone else had babies, but she had given birth to an angel. It seemed like Summer was ready to be discharged with her little angel, but the doctors decided to keep them for a couple more days. Summer told Austin he could come to pick them up the day after tomorrow, but she went around begging the doctors to let her go home early. She missed her husband. Don't even think about it today, we'll see after the rounds tomorrow, they said. During the rounds, Summer looked at the doctor with such pleading eyes that he finally said. All right, I'll prepare the discharge papers. You can leave after lunch. Call your husband. Summer began dialing Austin's number but then changed her mind. He was preparing to welcome them home tomorrow, probably took time off work. Why bother him today? She'd just call a cab to the maternity ward and get home perfectly fine on her own. Then in the evening, Austin would come back from work to find a surprise waiting at home, his girls were back. All those silly balloons and flowers for a discharge were just nonsense. The most important thing was to get home quickly. Summer was so eager to get home that she could barely wait for her discharge. She rushed out of the maternity ward like she was escaping captivity. The nurses helped her and the baby into a taxi, and off she went. The door to the house was open, but Summer wasn't surprised. Once a week, two girls from the cleaning company came to scrub the place spotless in a few hours. All Summer had to do was keep it tidy. Most likely, Austin had decided to tidy up the house before her arrival. She heard voices inside, but they clearly weren't the usual girls. Their unique accents had always amused and charmed Summer. In the living room, a woman's raised voice caught Summer's attention. It was Amalia. What was she doing here? From the tone of her voice, it was clear she wasn't here for a friendly welcome for her daughter-in-law coming home from the hospital. You had everything for a fantastic career, your father's position, my connections, and what do you have now? Amelia's irritation was growing. Such a promising start. And where have you landed? Mom, you're right, you're right, Austin replied defensively. Your habit of marrying is causing me problems, Amalia continued. The first time you ruined your career and almost drove your father to the grave, all because of some up-and-coming actress. I had no reason to love her. All right, you were young and foolish, but it's time to grow up. But everything is getting better now. Better? Everything is hanging by a thread. You won't get a chance like this again. Such great offers come once in a lifetime. Do you even understand that? And you bring this girl home and marry her. How do you plan to introduce her your partners? Mom, Summer might be a little simple but she's a good girl. And it's too late to change things now. We have a child. Yes, your summer is lovely. She's simply phenomenal. Not every woman can con a self-respecting man like that. 
and about the child. Look at these photos. Do you recognize your sweet, naive wife in them? This guy kissing her at the entrance to the hospital. He's her long-time love. They've been together since they were 15. I'm not lying, her mom told me. And here's a photo from the maternity ward. See her standing at the hospital entrance. Recognize him. He didn't come just once, look at the photos with different dates. Where did you get these? What concerns you more, where the photos came from or the fact that they exist? Are you not shocked? Isn't it astounding that this handsome guy is escorting your wife to the hospital and waiting outside the maternity ward? Do you still think the child is yours? It can't be. Don't you believe your own eyes? Take a good look. Think about what you'll do with all this. You can't handle another scandal, it'll ruin your reputation. Summer listened to the conversation, confused and unsure of what to do. Who were they talking about? She realized they were talking about her but couldn't believe it. She tried to muster the courage to enter the room several times but couldn't move out of fear. She heard Austin's angry voice and his mother's, and she understood that her beloved Austin believed everything he heard. Her attempts to defend herself would only make things worse. She held her daughter tightly, tears streaming down her cheeks from hurt and self-pity. Was her happy life really over? What about little Jia? Was she doomed to live without a family and love? What had she done to deserve this? Meanwhile, in the room, Summer and Jia's fate was being sealed. His mom had one. You realize we don't need a divorce, right? We don't want anyone to know you're married. I've contacted lawyers. There are ways to have the marriage declared invalid. That means there was no marriage, so there's no child. You're a single man, and your career is safe. Summer wanted to burst into the room, scream, yell, break something, make a loud and terrible scene, and confront that awful woman. What did she mean, no child? Here she was. Instead, she quietly picked up her bag from the floor and slowly walked out of the house. She walked aimlessly, tears flowing down her face. Passersby looked at the crying girl with a baby in surprise. Some approached and asked, do you need help? Summer just shook her head and kept walking. Finally, she got tired and sat on a bench in the park. She tried to think, but it was hard. Just then, Jia woke up and began to fuss. Suddenly, Summer's mind cleared. What are you sitting here for? The baby needs to be fed. What do you mean you have nowhere to go? Go home to mom. Her mother didn't even ask what had happened. It was clear her daughter was in trouble. We'll sort out who's right and who's wrong later. Right now, that's not important. Her mom helped her, of course. Without her, Summer would have struggled. But it was still tough. It felt like all her life was filled with constant feedings, endless crying from Jia and an overwhelming desire to sleep. At night, Summer would walk around the room with Jia in her arms, rocking her and trying to calm her down while Jia cried incessantly. During those moments, her mom would come to the rescue. Let me rock her, you try to get some sleep. No, mom, you have work in the morning. I know we're keeping you up, but just lie down for a bit. Jia would doze off for a short while, and Summer felt like she was fainting, only to be jolted awake by her daughter's cries. Her friends also helped her out. Tracy considered herself an expert on babies since she had raised two nephews herself. So, she would take Jia out for walks, giving Summer a chance to sleep. Rose had never looked after a baby, and she'd get wide-eyed at the sight of an infant, afraid even to hold one. So, she helped with chores, washing, ironing, cooking. After a year, Summer was completely exhausted, wondering how other women agreed to have a second or third child after such experiences. She had certainly heard that there were calm babies who cried little and slept through the night, but she didn't believe those stories. Jia seemed to sense that her mom had reached her breaking point, so she stopped crying and started sleeping through the nights. Summer slowly began to regain her strength. 
Suddenly, she realized she knew nothing about Austin, not even whether they were still married. But it didn't really matter. He hadn't reached out once in a year, so it was clear he'd erased both her and their daughter from his life. We don't need a dad like that, do we, my dear? Summer asked, and Jia just smiled in response and said, aha. Uh -huh. While Summer's life had come to a standstill for a year, her friends were living it up. Summer, check out that idiot. Rose exclaimed. Tracy's convinced Russ is cheating on her. For two months, she's been driving herself, him, and me crazy. I can't listen to this nonsense anymore. Summer, he's changed a lot. He used to not care what he wore, but now he's so picky. And suddenly he signed up for the gym. Who is he trying to impress? Maybe he's going to the gym with his mistress. Can you believe it? It's been two months. A man knows he looks less than great next to his gorgeous wife. He looks in the mirror, he knows what he's about. He's a smart guy, unlike his wife. He loves her and doesn't want to lose her. So he's trying to do something to keep you from being taken away. I just need Russ. Then let him find himself. Your jealousy is driving him crazy. Why are you getting on my case? What about you, Rose? Why don't you talk about your Lyle? Don't tell me how to live if you can't even handle your own life. Oh, I will. This story needs to be told so nobody else ends up being a fool. But you know, other people's experiences don't count, no one learns anything from them. Everyone just learns from their own mistakes. Rose always had plenty of admirers. There were always guys around her. But she could never stand to have someone around for too long. One guy lacked confidence, another wasn't good looking enough, and a third loved only himself. When Lyle took over the translation department, Rose was smitten. He was the man of her dreams, handsome, successful, and charismatic, with piercing black eyes that were impossible to resist. Every time he walked into the office, he flashed a charming smile and looked only at Rose. Everyone could see where this was headed, and they all knew that the boss was happily and firmly married. But Rose seemed to have lost her mind. They rarely got to spend time together. Their romance was limited to a few dinners and occasional meetings in not-so-expensive hotels. In the hotel room, Rose could hardly tear herself away from Lyle, but he kept glancing at the clock. Okay, Rose, I really have to go. Just stay a bit longer. Honey, you know I can't. Just hold on a little longer. In a week, we're flying to Boston. Two weeks, just the two of us. We'll stroll around, sit in cafes. Think about where you want to go, what you want to see. Or we could just stay in the hotel for two weeks. But right now, I'm sorry, I really have to go. Hug me. And stop looking at the clock, for crying out loud. At least try to be discreet about it. Rose worked alongside her classmate Molly in the department. They weren't really friends, but they worked closely together, had lunch together, and shared coffee breaks. Rose, are you really going with him? You know, Molly, I feel like everything will get sorted out there. Do you even hear yourself? What's there to sort out? Look at him, his face screams, jerk, dot. Shoo. He loves me. You're such an idiot. Okay, I'll show you a masterclass in this. Let's go, the meeting's starting. Rose and Molly returned to the department. Lyle approached the door, visible through the glass wall. Molly quickly adjusted her already short skirt, hopped onto a desk, and started rummaging through the top shelf of a cabinet for some files. When Lyle walked into the office, the first thing he noticed was Molly's perfectly shaped legs. Molly, be careful, don't fall. Let me help you. Thanks. Molly reached out and jumped off the table into her boss's arms. He didn't let go right away and held her for a moment longer. After the meeting, they were back to drinking coffee. Molly, what was that all about? Some cheap stunt. I don't get it. Are you defending him, thinking it's normal? What's so abnormal about it? 
he's a man. If he didn't react to your charms, that would be strange. Oh, he definitely reacted. I can tell you that. He's sensitive and responsive. He doesn't miss a chance to notice a pretty face. Are you blind or just stupid? Rose, forget about him. Why do you want to go to Boston with that scoundrel and his lustful eyes? I have vacation in two weeks. How about we go to Hawaii? Sun, beach, and we can find two awesome guys there. We could relax and maybe even find love. You know, holiday romances sometimes lead to something more. Sure, it's a slim chance, but you really have no future with Lyle. I love him, Rose whispered. And you're not the only one. Molly snapped back, there's at least one more, his wife. Don't remind me. I think about it all the time. A week flew by quickly. Tomorrow they were flying out. Rose knew it was wrong and ugly, but she thought, let me have two weeks of happiness, and then we'll see what happens. This was it, the last working day. Rose walked up to the office doors. Excuse me, are you Rose? A woman stopped her. Yes. Is Molly your friend? I'm Amanda, Lyle's wife. Oh my god, Rose felt a wave of heat wash over her. Is she going to demand I leave her husband alone? How embarrassing. Rose, I'm sorry. I saw you in pictures. Lyle said you and Molly are friends. I didn't know who else to turn to. I'm sorry I came. I was just desperate. No, I'm sorry, Rose mumbled. What happened? Lyle flew with your friend Molly. Rose, please talk to her when she gets back. She needs to break up with him. She shouldn't destroy a family. I don't know what I'll do. We have two kids. They went to Boston. Rose asked, for some reason. No, Hawaii. Rose couldn't go to work. She just couldn't. Everyone there already knew, discussing it, mocking her. She wouldn't find any curious or sympathetic looks. So, that's how my little romance turned out. But I've learned my lesson, don't get involved with married men. And by the way, Molly dumped Lyle right in Hawaii and left with some guy. She's a real piece of work, but she knocked some sense into me. The three friends sat together, grieving and mourning their lost dreams. Even Tracy, who seemed to have everything in order, cried for company. Why were they so unlucky? They were all smart and beautiful. The age-old question, what do these men really want? Jia was growing up, walking, and starting to talk. Rose and Tracy adored her, how could they not? She was a princess to them all. Summer was getting ready to return to work, it was time to stop living off her mom's money. It never seemed to be enough, and without the girl's help, they would have been lost. Outside, Jia fell into a puddle. Of course, just a family tradition. Summer scooped up her crying, muddy daughter and headed home. They had had enough fun for the day. To her surprise, she found a small vase on the kitchen table filled with apples and mandarins, a box of chocolates, a plate with leftover cheese, two coffee cups, and even two glasses with unfinished champagne. And the finishing touch, a crystal pitcher holding five white roses. Who had come to visit her mom? By the looks of it, they weren't friends. A thought crossed her mind. What if it was Austin? No, he would have waited for them. Besides, her mom wouldn't have shared champagne with him, she would have thrown the roses in his face. Why was she thinking about him again? He had betrayed her, abandoned Summer, and walked away from their love. If a man could do that, he was a traitor and didn't know how to love. He wasn't worth any regrets, memories, or tears. Such offenses are never forgiven. Oh, her mom was back. Now she could find out who had been visiting while they were out. Dorothy entered the apartment, closed the door behind her, and was quiet in the hallway. Summer peeked out. What happened? She froze. Her mom stood there, leaning against the doorframe and smiling. 
She looked radiant in her best dress, with makeup on, wearing heels she had sworn she wouldn't wear again because they were too much for her age. She sparkled and seemed nervous. Had she been on a date? Summer had never seen her mom like this before. Of course, happiness could make you act foolishly, but that wasn't her mom's style. Summer wrapped her arms around her mom's shoulders and led her to the kitchen, sitting her down in a chair. Tell me everything. The smile slid off Dorothy's face, and she murmured sadly. This is all so silly. It's just funny at my age. Tears welled up in her eyes. Mom, just tell me, and we'll figure out if it's silly or funny. Dorothy had worked her whole life in the city archive. About two weeks ago, a man in his fifties came in, with a kind but shy look on his face. He was interested in the technical documentation of one of the city's factories. He sat going through papers but kept stealing glances at Dorothy. He didn't say anything, just watched her. His name was Michael, which Dorothy learned from his request in the archive. He came back the next day and the day after. Dorothy occasionally glanced his way. His interest in her was so obvious that it was impossible to hide. Dorothy felt a mix of awkwardness and surprise. It had been a long time since anyone had looked at her that way. She even felt a bit sorry for him and smiled once. When he saw her smile, he seemed to light up with joy, so much so that Dorothy jumped a little. Had he fallen for her? No, she didn't need that. But when he didn't show up at the archive the next day, Dorothy felt a pang of disappointment, as if she had lost something important. After work, she immediately spotted Michael at the entrance, flowers in hand. Michael, where have you been? I thought something happened to you, she said. What could happen to me? Well, you spent two weeks choking on archive dust, looking at the same documents. It could drive anyone crazy. But I wasn't going to the archive. Where were you then? To see you. I love you, Dorothy. Are you out of your mind? Dorothy exclaimed, startled. I'm an old woman with a grown daughter and a granddaughter without a father. No, no, I've long forgotten what love is. What am I supposed to do if I love you, he asked. Have you completely lost it? Who are you, anyway? Where did you come from? Want me to tell you? There was a flicker of hope in Michael's voice. No, she had to put a stop to this immediately. But he looked so miserable. The flowers in his hands trembled. Fine. Come back tomorrow at ten. My daughter and child will be out for a walk. I'll listen to your story. And give me the flowers, if they're for me, of course. Sweet and shy Michael was in town on a month-long business trip. He was from the south, owned a little house in a small town near a lake, and worked as an engineer at a small machine shop. The factory hadn't built any machines for a long time, it just made parts, but the name stuck. He was 58 years old and had lived alone for almost five years. His wife had left him, and he had no kids. Local divorced women and widows chased after Michael, competing for his attention. After all, he was a good man, not a heartthrob, but decent, sober, with a home and a profession. A prize, not just any man. Fortunately, Michael had no idea about the turmoil surrounding his presence. When he saw Dorothy, he fell in love. He didn't know anything about her, nor did he care about how many husbands, children, or grandchildren she had. He thought it was all over for him, that he would never dream of a woman or a family again. And then, when he realized she wasn't married, hope sparked within him. The fact that she had children and grandchildren was great, he had no one. He already envisioned taking her to his little house by the lake, sitting in the garden while their grandchildren ran around. Michael could see it so clearly that he almost believed it. Now he just had to convince Dorothy of his love. But she was the one with doubts. Well, not exactly doubts about his love, she doubted whether she needed it. At her age, it was scary to throw everything away and jump into a new life with a stranger. Mom, what about you? Summer asked. 
It's surprising that someone could fall in love with me. I never dreamed of it. No, I meant how you feel about Michael. Summer, this isn't for me. What kind of love? I have you, that's enough for my life. Are you trying to hurt my feelings? So, you think Jia and I can't manage without you? You've already sacrificed your happiness for me. It's time for you now. Are you suggesting I pack up and leave for the ends of the earth with this man? I'm suggesting you go south with a good person, at least from what I can tell. His business trip is ending. So go check it out. And if you like it, stay there. Mom, don't worry about us, think about yourself. By the way, a little house by the lake wouldn't hurt us. What a mercenary daughter I have. Well, someone has to think about the future. Jia started throwing tantrums, refusing to eat, and then suddenly developed a fever. The doctor who was called to the house quickly identified the problem. It was lung issues, but not pneumonia, they would know more at the hospital, and she needed to go there now. Looking at Summer, frozen in horror, the doctor said. Miss, I know it's terrifying to send your child to the hospital, but believe me, it'll be scarier at home. They can diagnose her there, right now, it's unclear what we're treating. They wouldn't let Summer into the room with Jia. She could only stand outside the glass, watching her crying daughter and silently crying herself, careful that Jia wouldn't see her. They figured out what was wrong, but how to treat it remained unclear. The attending physician, a young and very serious woman named Anna, said they had gathered a panel of specialists. They were taking Jia's case very seriously, but everything was still uncertain, they were professionals, and everything would be revealed soon. Summer sat in a clinic corridor, waiting for the verdict. The panel would finish soon, and the head of pediatrics would finally tell her what was going on with her daughter. Summer, Daryl is waiting for you. Come on, I'll take you to him. A clearly tired man in surgical scrubs sat in the office. When he heard the door open, he looked up. It was Daryl, the same Daryl who once pulled a drunken Summer out from under the wheels of a car, staring at her with exhausted eyes, and of course, he didn't recognize her. Women change faster than men do. Come in. Your daughter is fine, everything is treatable. We know what's wrong with her, and we also know how to treat it. There's just one thing. Her condition can be either congenital or acquired. Both can be treated, but the protocols are different. We need to find out if there's a possibility of a genetic disorder. You and your husband just need to get your blood tested to rule out the genetic version. I'm confident it's not genetic, but we still need to eliminate that possibility. If I'm right, in three weeks, she'll be healthy. If it turns out to be congenital, it's not the end of the world, the treatment will just be different. It will take a bit longer, but your daughter will be healthy either way. Thank you, doctor. Now she had to call Austin. I wonder if he'll pick up. He did. Hey, Summer. Wow, he still has her number. Austin, I need a favor. Go to the children's clinic and get your blood tested. Are you planning on doing a DNA test? God, I'm not asking you for anything. I don't want paternity or child support. My daughter is sick. We need to rule out the possibility of a genetic disorder. Just get your blood tested so the doctors can figure out the treatment. I don't need anything from you, just a blood sample. Please, or the treatment might be wrong. Even if you think she's not your daughter, help the girl. All right, send me the address. Three weeks later, a cheerful and even healthier Jiao, thanks to the right hospital food, returned home. Grandma Dolores had settled into a little house by the lake by then. The three friends gathered again to share their girl talk. But first, Rose set a portrait of Dolores on the table and declared that from now on, she had no other idol but her. She gave her direction in life and hope for the future. It would be the same for everyone. Amen. I'm not going to stress about it anymore. By fifty, you can get married, divorce, suffer, and then suddenly, a man with a little house by the lake shows up. 
Yeah, sighed Tracy, with kids and grandkids. Wait, what's with that sigh? Girls, I'm pregnant. Wow, you and Russ finally made that decision. So why the sigh? You should be happy. But something was off, Tracy didn't seem happy. Tracy, what's wrong now? Are you jealous and doubting that the baby is his? God, you used to be such a cheerful girl. So you ended up with a boring husband, but you chose him. What's changed? Have you switched roles? Where's our wild, carefree Tracy? Tracy suddenly stood up and shouted, not at her friends but seemingly at the universe itself. I don't want to live with him. I don't want his kids. Summer and Rose froze. It sounded so heartfelt. It wasn't an act or a spontaneous outburst. In their own struggles, they had overlooked something important in Tracy's life. One friend's child was sick. The other was facing yet another collapse in her personal life. Of the three friends, Tracy had always been the most predictable and stable. They had noticed she had calmed down and seemed deflated, but they thought it was just age. Tracy, what happened? I can't talk about it, Tracy whispered barely audibly. What do you mean you can't? You're pregnant, you need to figure things out. You have a good husband. He loves you to pieces, and he dotes on you. That's true, girls, but I'm so tired, I can't take it anymore. I can't stand to see him. He's ruined my life. I don't sing, I don't dance, I don't breathe, I don't live. I don't exist. If I have a baby, I'll never be free of him. He doesn't know I'm pregnant yet. Got it. Here come the strange thoughts of a pregnant woman, nobody loves me, I'm worthless, and yet I don't want to see anyone, and everyone's a jerk. You scared us there. We almost believed that Russ turned out to be a monster. Tracy, it's obvious why you're not singing or dancing. You're pregnant. It's odd that Russ isn't sitting outside your window waiting for you. One of us got lucky. You've got a decent guy. Tracy, something's off with you. Sure, it's pregnancy and hormones, but if you're really that tired, you could get a divorce. Why freak out like this? They started comforting Tracy, wiping her tears, and explaining how lucky she was to have her husband. Finally, she agreed that she had the best husband in the world and that her life had turned out well. Suddenly, Rose jumped up on a chair, spread her arms wide, and announced in a TV announcer's voice. Dear friends, on the eve of International Women's Day, let me wholeheartedly congratulate you and gift you an unforgettable vacation by the sea. Silence. They didn't understand. What was that about? Girls, we're going to Egypt for ten days. I have a trip for three. No, Rose, what Egypt? I don't have any money. And I'm pregnant. Let me repeat this for the slow and pregnant. A broke Arab couldn't pay for our agency's services, so he provided us with rooms in his hotel. I don't get it either, but I didn't dig deeper. It's all-inclusive. If you don't have money, just stay within the hotel grounds. They'll feed you and keep you hydrated. It's a private beach. Pregnant women are advised not to ride camels. In short, that's it. We fly out in a month. It's going to be hot. I need to figure out how to explain this to Russ. Just explain it. He's so tired of your hysterics that he'll probably drive us to the airport. A knowledgeable person once said that in Egypt, a hotel booking doesn't guarantee a room by the sea. The hotel grounds start at the beach and stretch for about a mile and a half. To get a room closer to the sea, you need to slip the receptionist $10. A fancy bus picked up tourists from the airport and dropped them off at their hotels. The three friends, along with Jia, were dropped off at an incredibly beautiful building that sparkled with lights. Two doormen in traditional costumes stood at the entrance, wearing tall headdresses like those seen in ancient Egyptian frescoes. They were tall and slender, with long, chiseled faces that looked almost alive, or maybe they were wax figures. Summer thought with excitement that this is exactly how she had imagined pharaohs. 
She gazed in wonder at the beautiful faces, and one of the doormen suddenly winked at her. Bewildered, Summer walked into the hotel lobby. A fountain was gushing, palm trees were swaying, and tourists were seated at tables surrounded by various cafes and bars. Remembering the $10 tip, Rose had prepared the money in advance. She and Summer approached the reception desk together. Summer wore a crochet top made by her mom, revealing a skin-colored bra underneath. The young Egyptian at the desk couldn't take his eyes off Summer. Can we have rooms closer to the sea? The receptionist, still staring at Summer, handed them the keys. Rose hesitated, her hand twitching with the dollars. Should she give it or not? No, she'd wait. Clearly, he didn't want money, he wanted to see the crochet top. They were given plastic bracelets to wear, which would allow them to get drinks at the bar. The doormen grabbed their suitcases, and the friends rushed after him. They got the best rooms. Their suite had a terrace, and they didn't even have to go through the hotel to get to the beach, they could just walk down the terrace steps. Amazing what a crochet top can do. But only in Egypt. The girls were having the time of their lives. They went on excursions every day. Jia was particularly impressed by the mummies. She stared wide-eyed at the enormous cocoons. Summer stood in front of the display case with the golden mask of Tutankhamun for ages. Could such beauty really exist? The diving and desert safari went on without Tracy. However, she enjoyed a lovely boat ride on the Nile. Summer's dream of seeing the pyramids finally came true. It felt like something impossible in her life, seeing the pyramids was like flying to the moon, an event of the same magnitude. She was breathless as they approached Giza, and through the window of the tourist bus, the majestic structures began to appear on the horizon. The diving experience turned out to be just as thrilling. When they were booking their excursions, the girls had made it clear that they wanted no extreme activities. But suddenly, Summer felt a strong urge to try scuba diving. They explained that this excursion was for beginners, taking place in a calm, shallow lagoon with coral reefs. It was a guided tour underwater. Everything was beautiful, just like in the movies, white yacht, speed, sea, wind, and sunshine. The instructor was unbelievably handsome, tall, toned, with sun-bleached chestnut hair. He gave instructions, teaching them how to communicate with signals underwater, knowing the impression he made on the women, and he showed off as much as he could. Every girl on board felt he was speaking directly to her. When Summer and Rose put on their wetsuits, tanks, and lead belts, they could barely lift their feet to walk to the edge of the platform. The weight was incredible. Summer weighed less than the gear. Below, the instructor was swimming and waving his arms, jump. Summer was sure that with all that weight, she would sink like a stone. For some reason, they were the first from the group called to jump. If only they could see someone else jump and not drown, it would have been easier. Rose stood at the edge of the platform, suddenly pale and trembling. It was clear she wouldn't jump. They helped her down, removed her gear, and sat her on a couch with a whiskey. Summer was still at the edge. Well, they must know what they're doing, so Summer jumped. Surprisingly, she didn't sink right away. It was like she was pushed down like a buoy. The instructor swam over, explained how to breathe again, checked her air supply, took her hand, and pulled her down. Summer had heard that the Red Sea was the most beautiful, but she never imagined the sea floor could be so colorful and vibrant. There were multicolored corals, schools of fish, striped, spotted, yellow, blue, and red. There was a huge red flower with a blue outline. The instructor waved his hand in front of Summer's mask to get her attention, then pointed to the flower, which closed up in an instant. Wow, a predator! Summer was so amazed by all the colors that she didn't realize the camera operator had been swimming nearby the whole time. She only noticed when the instructor pointed at him, and he waved as if to say, wave to me. They helped Summer out of the water and back onto the yacht. It turned out walking on the deck with that gear was doable, but getting out of the water was tough. 
After getting off that incredible yacht, they handed her a disc with the recording of her underwater adventure. Back home, Summer watched that recording many times, unable to believe that it had really happened. On the rare days without excursions, they spent time at the beach. The sand was golden, the sea turquoise, it was like a fairy tale. Summer and Jia got bored and dashed off to the kids' zone with inflatable castles and slides. Sirius Tracy, dealing with her pregnancy, went back to the hotel, while Rose decided to lounge on the beach all day, thankful for the bar with free drinks right behind her. Oh God, it's so boring here. Under the neighboring umbrella sat two middle-aged women in bright swimsuits, wide-brimmed hats, and dark sunglasses covering half their faces. The hotels are shabby, the food is awful, and I can't stand this beach anymore. The only good thing is the free beer, but even that isn't good. Did you go to the pyramids or Luxor? Oh no, who wants to hop around ruins in this heat? No way. Egypt is a total dump. You could die of boredom here. This is our third time, and it's just depressing. Rose didn't even try to understand that logic. They're bored but haven't seen the pyramids. Egypt is terrible, but they come here for the third time. Who was she to teach grown women how to vacation? She relaxed and spread out on the sand. What a bliss. I want to live here. Right under this palm leaf umbrella on the beach. Rose? Is that you? Oh my god, why is this happening to me? A ghost from the past that she had long tried to erase from her memory, Lyle, was right in front of her. You couldn't hide from him, even in Africa. Lyle, what are you doing here? Rose, I suppose you're still mad at me. Why would I be? Lyle, you should leave, because my husband is really jealous. He'll hit you in the face first and then ask who you are. Oh, there he is with ice cream. Lyle didn't bother checking if Rose was telling the truth and walked away from the beach with a hurt expression. Rose watched where he was going. Well, of course, a bright blonde in a revealing swimsuit. Poor Amanda. How long does she have to suffer and wait for her husband to calm down? Now Rose was puzzled about how she had ever liked that jerk. It still felt unfair and embarrassing. So many resorts, hotels, and beaches in the world, and they run into each other here. Miss, are you upset about something? Maybe ice cream will smooth over your disappointment. A ten-year-old gentleman stood by her lounge chair with a chessboard under his arm, offering Rose ice cream. Wow! Who is this little lord? Excuse me, young man, what's your name? Mark. Nice to meet you. I'm Rose. What do you like? The sea, ice cream, chess, and my grandpa. Do you want to play chess? But I'm not that good, so you might not find it interesting. It's actually very interesting. Besides grandpa, no one else plays with me here. Rose kept losing, she wasn't great at chess. Mark taught her along the way, giving tips, and finally, Rose won. Looking into Mark's clever eyes, she realized he had let her win, but she was still thrilled. Rose jumped up and danced around the umbrella with the lounges. Yay! I won. Yay! Mark jumped up too, and they started dancing wildly. Some people joined in, and the crowd on the beach laughed and clapped. Mark, I've been looking for you all day. Why didn't you answer your phone? A short man stood in front of Mark. Oh, Grandpa, my phone died. I'm sorry. I'm going to introduce you to Rose. She's so cool, Mark shouted, Rose, come here. Rose, this is my Grandpa, Gerald. Rose, would you like to have coffee with me and this little rascal? Gerald had spent his life sailing the seas, serving in the Merchant Navy. When a car accident claimed the lives of his son and daughter-in-law, he retired, came ashore, and dedicated his life to his grandson. He knew he could never replace the boy's parents, but he wanted Mark to feel loved and not abandoned. Gerald also had his own ideas about what a real man should be, and he did everything he could to help his grandson grow up to be just that. After that, 
Rose's friends never saw her again. She had disappeared, always with Gerald and Mark, on boat trips, desert safaris, riding camels, and visiting Berber villages. They were interested in everything, as long as they were together. They went here and there, always with Mark and his grandfather. Girls, I can't help it. He's such a man. What man? He's an old man. Better an old man like him than a young jerk. Girls, I love him. Say what you want, but he's my man. I'm going to marry him, and I'll have a grown son. Do you have logic problems? If you marry Gerald, you'll have a grandson, and you'll become a grandmother. Rose, don't you think you're swinging from one extreme to another? You were involved with a married man. Remember how you got out of that mess, how much you cried. And now you've fallen for a guy twenty years older. Sure, riding camels is fun, but how will you live with him? And a ten-year-old boy isn't a baby, he has a personality and a life with his grandfather. Do they really need you? I don't know if they need me, but I need this grown man and this boy. Tracy, just don't say anything. You're the lucky one, and Summer and I are the unlucky ones. Everything is wrong for us. Right now, I know that if I'm with this man, I'll have everything I've dreamed of. I don't need your arguments or wise advice. I don't want to hear it, girls. Sorry, but you can go to hell. On their last evening, Rose and Gerald decided to spend some time alone. The girls were flying home in the morning, while Gerald and Mark were staying for another week. Mark was preparing his grandfather for the date with great care, picking out his shirt, suit, and even running around for flowers. Gerald had forgotten what girls liked, but Mark was in the know. Gerald believed that there could be no one in his life besides Mark, while Mark wanted nothing more than for his grandfather to be happy. Rose sat in the restaurant, anxious and ready to speak her mind. She knew Gerald liked her, and it was time to tell him. She wouldn't forgive herself if she left without saying anything. She'd end up living with regret, thinking about how she had a chance to be happy but let it slip away. But Gerald didn't come. The waiter checked on her several times, asking if she'd like to order anything. She only ordered wine and kept waiting. An hour later, it became clear that there was nothing left to wait for. But Rose wasn't giving up. She decided to go to Gerald's room. Mark opened the door. Rose? Where's Grandpa? That's what I came to find out. I've been waiting for him for an hour. Rose, he was getting ready, and he was nervous. So where is he? Let's go find him. There were many bars in the hotel, and they found Gerald at the beach bar. The wait staff were giving him strange looks. It was late, and nobody was sitting on the beach anymore, they would have closed long ago, but he just wouldn't leave. Judging by the empty shot glasses on the table, he had drunk a lot. Mark, does your grandpa drink like this often? This is the first time I've seen him like this. Okay, you go ahead. I'll handle it from here. Just don't scold him too much. He's worried about you. He likes you but thinks he's too old for you. Go on, you soul expert, don't worry, I won't hurt his feelings. The beach was dark and empty, and the bar lights were off. Only a lantern shone over the last table occupied by a single guest. The sea was invisible, but the sound of the waves and the rustling of unseen palm trees filled the air. From the hotel, music floated in, the sound of a wild tourist party. Against the backdrop of cheerful tunes, the solitary older man sitting under the bright lantern with a few empty shot glasses looked particularly lost. Rose walked along the shaky wooden walkway over the sand. Her heart ached for the strong man who had bravely taken on the responsibility of a child but faltered at the thought of love. As she sat down at the table, Rose pushed the empty shot glasses aside. Gerald lifted his cloudy, pained eyes. Why did you come? Go away. I'm not leaving. You can't get rid of me now. I'm not going to stop. I'm an old, sick man. I'll ruin your life. I won't take that kind of sin on my conscience. Mark and I have an established life. 
I know I'm not company for him, but that's how it is. And you're not company for anyone. I'm too old, and Mark is too young, so go back to your young life and forget about us. Gerald tried to get up but couldn't, he leaned on the table. Rose stood up, sat on the table across from Gerald, and put her hands on his shoulders. I don't want my life. I want yours. What are you afraid of? Disappointment? You can't refuse me. Don't try to convince me that your life is over. You still need to raise Mark. Let me spend these years with you. If you push me away now, nothing will change in your life, except for more sadness. And I'll live with the belief that the most wonderful thing that could have been has slipped by. Sure, I might have some relationships and get married, but I'll compare everyone to you, and no one will measure up. Leave. I don't need anyone. I'm leaving. I'm flying out tomorrow, but I'll be waiting for you at the airport in a week. You have time to think. But right now, get up and let's go. Mark is hiding behind the bushes, scared to leave you alone. A real man doesn't abandon his family. He's not afraid to change his life, but you, Gerald, are just being a coward. In the morning, the girls boarded the bus and headed to the airport. Rose's friends didn't pester her with questions, what was there to ask? It was clear her friend was going through a drama. After the sea and sun, summer felt light, free, sun-kissed, and washed clean by the ocean. No more reflection, no more sadness or regrets from the past. Her mom was happy, her daughter was healthy, what else was there? Of course, she wanted to fall in love, she was ready, but she was scared of making another mistake. She often remembered Daryl, the pediatrician. But why dwell on the past? She should have thought about it ten years ago. Why think about it now? It felt like life was changing. Nothing seemed to be happening, but then Rose called. Summer, Gerald and Mark are flying in tomorrow. Please, come with me to the airport. I can't ask Tracy, I can't deal with a pregnant woman fainting. Why should I go? If he loves you, he'll rush to you when he arrives. If he doesn't, he'll walk past you with a poker face. What do I need to be there for? Summer, please, I'm scared. There was desperation in Rose's voice. Meeting Gerald could determine her fate. Summer couldn't leave her friend alone at such a crucial moment. She knew she wouldn't be much help, but she said. Pick me up, we'll go together. In the arrivals hall, Rose quietly maneuvered through the crowd and stood by the door. Arriving passengers hugged their relatives, but Gerald still hadn't shown up. Rose glanced around, her pained eyes searching for Summer, who cheerfully waved and smiled, as if to say everything was fine and they would be out soon. Rose, we're here. Mark was tapping on the glass, but a customs officer politely pushed him away from the window. Boy, who are you with? Please get in line for inspection. Well, Mark clearly looked excited. But what would Gerald say? Gerald saw Rose by the door with wild eyes and hugged her tightly, as if afraid she would be taken away. Sorry, I love you. I said horrible things out of fear. I couldn't believe there was still room for a miracle in my life. No matter how much time I have left, I want to spend it with you. The scariest half hour of my life has already passed. I was afraid you wouldn't be here. Summer stepped out of the airport and got into a taxi. She wasn't needed there anymore. Another friend had found her happiness. Now it was her turn. It was unclear where her happiness had gotten lost, as it never seemed to reach her. Oh, Daryl, weary pediatrician, why didn't you see her ten years ago and hold on? So here they were, two lonely souls wandering the earth, making mistakes, and hoping for happiness. But that was just Summer's imagination. Her personal life hadn't worked out, she fell for the wrong guys, while Daryl was probably doing fine. But it was nice to dream that he remembered her, missed her, and regretted letting her go. But Summer told herself not to create another sad love story or a reason to suffer. Jia was being fussy, refusing to go to preschool. 
They had just approached the kindergarten, but she kept whining. Jia, why are you crying? Don't you want to go to preschool? Don't you like it there? I like it. I have friends there. Then why are you crying? Look, everyone is crying. I want to cry too. Well, go ahead and cry. She left her child at daycare and hurried home. There were still a couple of hours to spare. She was no longer a librarian but a college professor. Since there were no morning classes, she could relax and enjoy a cup of coffee. But that plan was quickly derailed. Austin was standing by the entrance. Austin. What are you doing here? Who are you stalking? I want to see my daughter. Seriously? You haven't thought about her in five years, and now you suddenly care. What makes you think she's even yours? You've already decided I'm not your wife, and she's not your daughter. Listen, I might not be much as a husband, but I'm not a total jerk as a person. Yeah, I back down like a coward, but I want to make things right. Did your mom not find you a suitable match? No worthy candidates. I get it, there are only fools around. Your high moral family wouldn't want someone like that around. By the way, I don't see you as a coward or a weakling, just a jerk. You don't have a daughter. Our marriage was fake, and she was born from who knows who. You can take a paternity test, but then you'll have to pay child support. Is that what you want? You lived without a daughter for five years, keep living that way. I doubt your mom would appreciate your sudden change of heart. Did you even consult her before coming here? Summer, you can mock me all you want. But can we at least try to make things work for our daughter? No, we can't. I cried for a long time. I imagined you coming, hugging me, telling me it was all nonsense and that you loved us. But you never came. We've learned to live without you. Right now, we don't need you. Unexpected, unwanted, and unloved. Don't try to change yourself for our daughter. It's better for her not to know anything about you. Why should she face childhood disappointments? It's strange that you even remembered us. Did you have a career change, and suddenly you needed a wife and kid? You've changed. You've become tough and uncompromising. Well, life taught me. Don't come back here. There's no compromise for you. It was odd, she used to love him, and now there was nothing but indifference. Maybe something was wrong with her. She had loved Alan, fell out of love in a day, and now felt the same way about Austin. There was both passion and a child involved, yet inside, she felt empty. Apparently, resentment and disappointment can outweigh love. If Austin hadn't betrayed her, she would have spent her whole life with him. She adored him, protected him, never left him in poverty or sickness. But he didn't care about such loyalty, just like he didn't care about their daughter. Why did he even come? What a jerk. He didn't even bother to apologize, he just showed up, thinking he was bringing her happiness, while she was the ungrateful one who didn't appreciate it. Jia sometimes didn't want to go to daycare, and sometimes it was impossible to get her out. Summer had been waiting by the door for ten minutes. And she still had to get home and cook dinner. Summer was exhausted, she just wanted to collapse on the couch and sleep for a couple of days. But that wasn't in the cards. Tomorrow she'd have to wake up early and do it all over again, daycare, work, grocery shopping, daycare, home. How long could this go on? What about rest, the sea, the sun, joy, and love? When had that all happened? Or maybe it hadn't. Was it just an illusion? Well, the sea and the sun were definitely real, but love seemed to be a figment of her imagination. The weather was miserable, just like that fateful day she met Austin. It was either snowing or raining, with mud underfoot. Jia slipped and fell. Summer pulled her by the hand, they had to reach the bus stop. Finally, they arrived. But where was that damn bus? It was chilly, and Jia whined, I'm freezing, I want to go home. And the bus was nowhere to be found. God, what was going on? 
she couldn't even get her child home without freezing. How long would this dark streak in her life last? When would the light come? In college, Summer had a colleague who was an unshakable optimist. She was always signing up for personal growth courses, self-esteem boosts, attracting luck, and landing millionaires. With a heap of useless knowledge and a fountain of optimism, she freely shared with her colleagues. She came off as a bit quirky and out of touch, but her desire to spread happiness didn't really bother anyone. On the contrary, it often lifted spirits. Now, Summer vividly recalled one of her enthusiastic quotes, Girls, little annoyances are not a reason to feel down. So you're standing at the bus stop, and the bus isn't coming, and taxis aren't stopping. You're angry, cursing fate, but fate isn't just hinting, it's shouting that you don't need this bus. There are trains, planes, and yachts out there. You're meant for bigger and better things, not this overcrowded bus. Listen to fate, change your life. Summer even smiled. It was interesting to wonder where they taught such things and, more importantly, who believed in it. Right now, she was going to change her life. She would grab Jia, dash to the airport, and then head off to a happy life. But where would she get the money for a plane ticket when she could only afford a bus ride? Coaches didn't teach you that. No matter what fate was screaming, she just wanted to get home. A new life could wait, she needed to sort out the old one first. A car pulled up to the bus stop, and the door opened. Summer, is that you? Get in quick, you can't stand here. Not recognizing who had called her, Summer grabbed Jia and plopped into the seat. She was freezing, and it didn't matter who was giving them a ride. Alan was behind the wheel. Ghosts of the past came rushing back. Whatever, as long as he got them home. Alan was talking about something, but Summer wasn't listening. She was staring at the worn man, confused about how he had once seemed incredibly handsome to her. What had happened to him? People couldn't change that much in ten years. Was he drinking? She felt scared. Why had she gotten in the car? He was unstable. Alan, thanks. Just stop here. Come on, I know where you live. I'll drive you. I have the evening free. If you invite me for coffee, I won't say no. Stop. Alan, watch the road, Alan. With a sudden jolt, the car skidded on the slick road and rolled into a ditch. Summer managed to grab Jia, but she hit her head and lost consciousness. Bystanders rushed to the overturned car, some called for an ambulance, while others tried to open the doors and get the passengers out. They sat Summer up against a tree right in a puddle. She heard someone yelling, the sound of an ambulance siren, and suddenly, through the noise in her ears, she heard Jia crying. She's alive. Where are you, my girl? Summer tried to get up but was held back by someone gripping her shoulders. Easy now, everything's fine. Your daughter isn't hurt, just scared. How do you feel? Summer tried to assess her condition. She didn't seem to have any pain, just a ringing in her head. I'm fine. Help me get up, I'm going to freeze in this puddle. Well, look at that, another puddle. It felt like a family curse. On shaky legs, she approached the ambulance. The doctors were examining Jiao. A bruise on her shoulder, nothing more. But they still needed to take her to the hospital. You should go to the hospital too. But I understand you'll go with your daughter. Get in, let's go. What about the driver? He's in worse shape. Fractures and a ruptured spleen. But he's alive. They've already taken him away. Is he your husband? Why would he drive in that condition? Listen, miss, you should leave him and take care of your child. Summer wouldn't rush to save Alan. Maybe she would have before, but her selflessness had never been appreciated. All her men took it for granted and considered it a weakness. They just wiped their feet on an idealist like her. But she needed to call Rose to help her brother, he needed support now. That could wait. Right now, 
she needed to get herself together and make sure Jia was okay. Her head was still spinning, but that was probably a good thing. She couldn't focus on anything, her mind felt completely blank, just a sense of lightness and a belief in her invulnerability. How was it possible? To get in an accident and come out with just dizziness and a bruise on her daughter's shoulder? Miraculous, no doubt. Miss. The paramedic snapped his fingers in front of Summer's face. I think you need to go to the hospital. No, I'm fine. Well, if you're fine, let's go. We're heading to pediatrics. If needed, they'll check you out too. They drove through the evening city for a long time. The siren didn't help with the traffic. In the miserable conditions on the road, cars couldn't budge out of the ruts to give way to the ambulance. By the time they reached the clinic, the attendants were already waiting at the doors. They whisked Jia away somewhere. Summer dragged herself down endless hallways. She collapsed into a chair by the door marked, Emergency Room, waiting. Oh, I remember you. Standing in front of Summer was Anna, who had once been Jia's doctor. Don't worry, Jia is fine. We did an x-ray, the surgeon is looking at the images now, but I can tell you without the scans or the surgeons that everything is okay. She'll have a bruise, of course, but just apply some ointment, and it'll be fine. Just sit tight, Daryl will be in to talk to you shortly. How about you? Do you need any help? No, thanks, Anna. Wow, you remember my name. Usually, parents are so in shock they don't notice anyone. By the way, who is Daryl to you? Nobody. Come on, he couldn't take his eyes off your daughter last time and turn pale when he saw her now. Honestly, it's not my business, but I feel bad for a good person. He's a wonderful doctor. Everyone admires his professionalism, but no one notices he doesn't have a personal life. I think there's something between you two. Sorry if I'm overstepping. Just sit tight, they'll be in to talk to you soon. Anna left, and Summer's mind was racing. Who should she think about? Jia or Daryl? What did he mean by, no personal life? Men like him should have vibrant, exciting lives. If she had at least a semblance of a personal life, then surely Daryl should too. But hers was far from perfect. Worry for Jia and the buzzing in her head made her feel oddly calm about meeting Daryl. How many times had she imagined their reunion, rehearsing what she would say? But now, there was no anticipation or excitement, only emptiness and an overwhelming fatigue that felt numbing. She just wanted to take Jia home and sleep for a good two days. Jia came bouncing down the corridor, cheerful and bright-eyed. Of course she was excited, this wasn't daycare, it was the hospital, and everything was so fascinating. A man in a doctor's coat followed her. Summer recognized him immediately. It was Daryl. Suddenly, her fatigue vanished, and her heart raced. What would she say? How should she act? She had already missed two chances to be with him. She couldn't let this one slip away, but that was just her overthinking. He probably didn't want anything to do with her. And of course, here she was again, wet and dirty. Great. Jia jumped into her mother's arms, kissing her and excitedly sharing how cool the hospital was, how they used lasers like in cartoons. Summer listened, nodding along, her gaze flickering to the approaching Daryl. Hey, Summer. Wow, you've changed, he said. Got older and scruffier. You've matured. You've gone from a cute girl to a beautiful woman. Just a little standard compliment, it's part of the job. Honestly, I wouldn't have recognized you if it weren't for Jia. I'm really glad to see you, even if this hospital setting isn't exactly joyful. Believe it or not, I've thought about you often. I don't know what got into me back then, I should have never let you go. When Jia ended up here, I realized you were married, and I figured there was no place for me in your life. But things are different now. That wasn't your husband behind the wheel, was it? And Jia let slip that you two live together. No dad around, and grandma's remarried. 
Jia, we agreed not to mention grandma to anyone. But mom, he's a doctor. It's fine. Yes, it's fine. Summer, wait five minutes. My shift is over, I'll change and drive you home. No, that's too much. It's more inconvenient to drag a kid home across town in the middle of the night in this awful weather. I'll be quick, just wait here. Well, she really wanted to see him, but now she was running off. No way. Everything felt so uncertain, her thoughts were scattered, and her heart was in turmoil. The weather was just as confused. It was spring on the calendar, but winter had decided it wasn't done yet. The white snow fell silently, mercilessly weighing down regrets and unfulfilled dreams. Standing on the hospital steps, Summer saw the white wall of snow separating her from the city. It felt like nothing existed beyond it. If she stepped forward, she'd end up in an endless white tunnel. Maybe this was her fresh start. No. There was a whole radiant and happy world out there. She was getting lost in her dreams again, all because a familiar face had offered to drive her home. Snow fell, nothing unusual about that, but the feeling of change was strong and palpable. It was that scene from a dream. Step behind the white curtain and say everything she had never managed to express, how she craved love, how she had erred and cried at night, how she regretted missed opportunities but believed happiness was inevitable. And the only audience in that hall would be Daryl. Her monologue was meant for him alone. If he heard it, her life would finally feel right, just as it was meant to be. Deep down, an incessant voice whispered, You've done this before with Alan and Austin. Don't conjure up another impossible love. Enough with the disappointments. Daryl remembered Summer and was glad to see her, but that was all. There was no guarantee he wanted to marry her or share her joys and sorrows. Most likely, he was married. And even if he wasn't, he probably had a mountain of disappointments and unresolved issues. By the time Daryl walked out of the hospital, Summer felt like she'd already married him, suffered, and divorced him. He was just a familiar face, someone with whom she shared nothing, though she appreciated him driving her home. Sitting in the car, Summer couldn't help herself. Daryl, remember the story about the girl who left you for her boss? How it didn't work out? Are you trying to find out if I'm married? I'm not, but I was. I had a good wife, beautiful and smart. The only downside was she didn't love me. When we divorced, she said her love was enough for both of us to be happy. But I believe love has to be mutual. If one loves and the other doesn't, that's not love. I don't know what you'd call it, good, decent feelings, but not love. I felt such despair then, fearing I wouldn't know what love truly was. I thought of you. But really, what was there to remember? Just a girl I met by chance who never got to talk to me properly. It's like dreaming of something that never came true. If it had, there would have been happiness, but now you've started to drift back into my life, and I'm dreaming again. If I'm unwanted and unexpected, just tell me. I get it, a chance encounter doesn't mean I'm the one you've been dreaming about. But I'll drive you home, and then we'll go our separate ways. I've thought of you often too, but you're just driving us home. Are you sure about that? Absolutely. In the morning, Summer looked at Daryl lying next to her. Her thoughts were tangled, and her heart skipped a beat. Even if he got up and left right now, she would still be grateful for this happiness. She had dreamed about this moment, and it had finally come true. She didn't know what he was thinking or what his plans were, but if it were up to her, she would kiss him and hold him tight, never letting him go for even a moment. Summer quietly got up and headed to the kitchen. She peeked into Gia's room. She was still sleeping. Remembering how Daryl hadn't fed her lobster or poured champagne but had made her an omelet, Summer thought, well, I'll make him pancakes, damn it, why can't she think about anything but this man? It would be nice to know what he was thinking too. Meanwhile, Daryl was thinking that he was finally lucky. He heard Summer rustling around in the kitchen and wished it could be like this for the rest of his life. His dreams had come true, 
This was love, not one-sided but real. If Summer said that one night together wasn't a reason to get married, he would agree. It would be foolish and carefree. But right now, Daryl wasn't going anywhere, he just wanted to find out what was on Summer's mind. Their romantic breakfast was interrupted by Summer's phone ringing. It was Rose. Summer, I went shopping early, and I think my car was stolen. Gerald isn't in town, and I have no one else to help me. I'm freezing here and don't know what to do. Can you come? Please help, friend. Where are you? I'll be right there. Daryl, can you give me a ride? Rose was bouncing up and down with cold next to a pole. When she saw Summer running toward her, she threw her arms around her in tears. I left my car here. I came back, and it's gone. Rose, I don't drive. But even I know you can't park under a no parking sign. Call the towing company, it's probably there. Okay, I'm calling. Hi, can you tell me if a blue Toyota is in your lot? The license plate. I'll call back. Rose, you don't know your car's license plate. I don't. The car isn't mine, it's Gerald's. I accidentally scratched mine a week ago, and it's in the shop. And where's the registration? It's still in the car. Great. Call Gerald. He probably knows his own car's number. If you describe it, well, it's a little blue thing, I'm afraid they won't give it back. Your husband is lucky to have such a smart, level-headed wife. Not everyone gets that. Rose blinked in outrage, even opening her mouth to launch into a defensive tirade for her beloved husband, but Summer quickly cut off her flow of indignation. Don't get into it, I'm just thinking out loud. Focus. Call him. While Rose was on the phone with Gerald, explaining what had happened, Summer watched Daryl and Jia as they approached. Jia was holding Daryl's hand, bouncing along, chatting excitedly. Daryl responded, his face lit up with an idiotically happy smile. He loved feeling connected to the lives of this little girl and her mother. Rose quickly wrapped up her conversation with her husband and asked. Who's that Jia is holding hands with? Summer said nothing. What an interesting man, who is he? Something told her he wasn't the ex-husband. Summer wouldn't look so radiant if he were. It felt like a new beginning for her. Just two days ago, she had talked with Summer and she hadn't mentioned any man. And now, look, a happy family. A fleeting thought crossed Rose's mind that this could be the Daryl everyone had heard about but no one had seen. But she quickly dismissed it. It seemed too far-fetched. Where would Summer have met him in just two days? Besides, Summer had a habit of imagining unattainable loves. Daryl probably hadn't spent years dreaming about her. Love wasn't like the flu, you couldn't catch it. Summer was in love and seemed genuinely happy. That was great, especially since Rose had been worried about her friend. It felt unfair that out of the three of them, the one most suited for family life was the only one without a husband. Tracy had spotted Russ, whom Rose thought was plain, as a reliable, devoted man and a talented lawyer with a bright future. Rose had taken a winding path to happiness, filled with thorns and bumps, but she had made it. Summer, on the other hand, who believed life was dull without a husband and kids, had kept making mistakes. Her relationship with Alan had been just a childhood crush that vanished as soon as she looked closer. With Austin, it was an overwhelming desire to be close to someone, and she didn't mind that their life didn't resemble a typical family, she would have continued that way, justifying her love for Austin and thinking it was how it should be. Luckily, thanks to her mother-in-law, she hadn't gotten stuck in those relationships. Now, everything seemed to be falling into place. Rose hadn't met this wonderful man yet, but she already liked him. Ever since she met Gerald, she believed in intuition and fate. As Daryl approached, Rose whispered. Summer, stop keeping me in suspense. Who is he? He's Gia's doctor. We were in an accident yesterday. They brought us to the hospital, Summer replied. Let's talk about the accident later. 
so you brought the doctor home. I wouldn't say no to a doctor like that. I hope he didn't just treat your wounds. Rose, shut up. Summer hissed. Okay, okay. Jia threw her arms around Rose's neck, breathlessly recounting their adventures from the previous day. From Jia's reaction to her mom's friend, Daryl realized that Rose wasn't just a friend but someone very close to Summer. Meeting the loved one's close friends confirmed his status. He felt nervous about how Summer would introduce him, would he be just a casual acquaintance? Rose, meet my Daryl. The one I talked about. Remember? Rose's eyes widened in surprise, while Daryl let out a sigh of relief. The one she talked about, it felt nice, but what mattered most was that Summer had talked about him, meaning she had thought of him. Their meeting years ago hadn't been a coincidence, they just hadn't realized it at the time. Daryl used to regret not holding on to that naive, genuine girl, but now he was kicking himself for not reaching out to her back then. He should have looked closer and given himself a chance. Back then, he thought he would meet plenty of girls like her. Turns out, he hadn't met anyone like her at all. Now she stood next to him, looking at him with love in her eyes. No way. This can't be real. I've heard so much about the extraordinary and unreal Daryl for so many years that I thought you were a phantom, an idealized version created by Summer. But you're real and alive. You know, we all dream of love. For Summer, love is the meaning of life. She waited so long for you. Don't turn your back on happiness, fate might get upset and not give you another chance. Oh, what am I saying? Since you're here, it means everything has already happened. Well, now I'm absolutely happy, 